You are entering the realm of the Time Prophet, exploring the darker regions of time and the world about us. Liberator, teleport me now. We start off in a place which is supposed to be London and not a Shepperton set with the sounds of Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. The piano tone almost a foreboding as to what is coming next. Tom Campbell walks down the street in his police uniform. He is staring into the window of a travel shop and obviously has dreams of going to far off lands. I don't know but I think he may be in for a shock. A guy creeps up behind him and violently smacks him around the head with a kosh. Already the tone is very different to the first movie and has a lot less comedy. For instance, we lost the comedy stand-in Roy Castle who played Ian and instead we get Bernard Cribbins who plays Tom Campbell who in my view is funnier than Roy that also plays the part a little more seriously. Unfortunately we also lose Barbara and instead we get Louise played by Joel Curzon. Louise being the cousin of Barbara and the niece of the doctor who again is portrayed as a human in this movie. Now Barbara Wright was a strong female lead in the first movie but unfortunately Louise was a forgotten extra in this one which is a shame and dressing her as Sherlock Holmes does not help either. It's amazing how many times in a movie you can get knocked out and be fine when in reality it can very often end in tragedy. A jewellery shop is robbed while Tom is trying to recover from his brutal attack. He blows his whistle as they speed off into the distance. He senselessly throws his truncheon at them even though there is no chance of hitting anything. Bleary eyed he spots the police box and the next thing he does is rather strange. Rather than going for the box on the front which housed the telephone, he opens the main door. He is confronted by the doctor, Susan and Louise and falls into unconsciousness. You will notice that you can't see the street behind him through the open door and if you look very carefully you can see that the black curtains are on the outside of the doors as well. But this is how it should really look. Now because this movie closely resembles the Doctor Who TV depiction, don't be surprised if I refer back to this quite a bit. I do like this movie, but there are some things about the original TV series I like better, William Hartnell for one. It seems now that the Doctor has added some security to the TARDIS at last and mentions demagnetizing the door. At last he uses the monitor to check what is going on outside and he has upgraded this monitor to colour. The TARDIS in the first movie was more rudimentary. The TARDIS dematerialises and there is none of that wheezing and groaning that you come to expect from the TARDIS but it just melts into the night. We cut to the interior of the TARDIS and Tom wakes up and stares at a set that is almost lost in space inspired where you have black curtained walls with various electronic junk just placed in random arbitrary places. Although they did put more thought into this TARDIS than in the original movie, you will often find the same pieces of technical junk turning up in other well-known science fiction shows. The Doctor states that Tom cannot use the telephone and that it wouldn't do much good in 2150 AD. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Doctor Who, this is my niece Louise Hello. and my granddaughter Susan. Tom opens the door of the TARDIS and emerges into London but years in the future. Well it was supposed to be London but it was an obvious film set in a massive studio and Tom noticed it is daytime. Just as time is regarded as the fourth dimension, so space is equally the fifth dimension. For space knows no boundaries and it's completely timeless. This is where the story starts in the TV version. You will notice everyone has an opinion except for Louise who is just there for eye candy. If Barbara was here she would have said something being a strong woman. 
Susan steps on something which is attached to something, which makes the other something fall. Tom bravely runs and saves Susan from the falling rubble without a fault, but the TARDIS gets covered in debris. No way could they get away now. Strangely, it is Susan that causes the catastrophe in the TV series also. However, the rubble in the TV series falls from a logical railway bridge that is overhanging. The rubble in the movie seems to fall from space as if there is nothing above, so it doesn't have the same kind of logic to it. The distance shot is so bad I was half expecting a giant cat to be walking across the skyline. The Doctor and Tom enter a building and they don't seem too worried about leaving the ladies outside. I mean they have no idea that in 2150 what is safe and what isn't. This does not seem to be the Doctor from the first movie, but a much more adventurous action packed Doctor. I mean I could understand him leaving Barbara outside, she was strong and dashing, but Louise seems a bit lacking in what it takes to take on an alien environment. At least in the TV series there was a logical reason why Barbara and Ian had to stay behind. Susan had badly sprained her ankle. However, in the movie, there was no reason why Susan and Louise couldn't have stayed with the Doctor. Then it happens. Tom discovers the Roboman. However, he would be forgiven for thinking it was just an ordinary man with a motorbike helmet on. It's almost like they didn't even try. At least in the TV series, they gave the Roboman some scientific headwear that didn't look like a motorbike helmet. He is even wearing sunglasses, and they have glued a fairly obvious transistor radio to the side of the helmet. Compare this to the original, where you can almost see the brain of the robotized human. The Robomen look scary in the TV series, but these look like 60s Hells Angels. Also, I should point out that sunglasses are not really needed with the British weather. One second Louise is with Susan, and in the next shot, Louise finds herself on her own at the side of the Thames. In the TV version, it is obvious that she is dampening her cloth to help with the swelling on Susan's foot, but in the movie version, this is not clear. I mean, she hasn't even looked at Susan's foot at all. This might be down to the running time of the movie compared to the TV series, but it was a bit disjointing, that's all. Also, every self-respected Londoner knows that the water in the Thames is not fit for drinking or to be used in the reduction of the swelling. When Louise gets back, Susan is gone. Wyler grabs Louise and tells her Susan is safe, and then we cut back to the Doctor and Tom, as Louise is not so important in this movie. Strangely, the character of Wyler is not in the TV series at all, just Carl Tyler. Why they changed his name for the movie, nobody knows. Tom looks at the Roboman's helmet and says it looks like a radio of sorts, and the Doctor opens it up and goes, oh yes, highly advanced. Although to me, the fact it has an Earth-type resistor on the circuit board would say it isn't as advanced as the Doctor made out. Also, the miniature antenna may have been miniature for the 1960s, but it's flipping huge to modern standards. Then the music takes on a serious carry-on sound. Some strange person is watching them, and gunfire is heard in the distance. We will find out later that the Watcher is actually David, played by Ray Brooks. Tom, being the comedy fall guy, nearly kills himself when he opens the door and nearly falls to his death. More shots ring out. Meanwhile, Louise and Wyler are making their way to wherever they are going, and a strange craft flies overhead with spinning windows. I do hope there are no Daleks in there, or they will have a headache for sure. Tom and the Doctor also see the ship, and Tom exclaims it's a flying saucer. It may have been a flying saucer, but it wasn't my cup of tea. They go in search of the girls. The saucer lands, and Louise and Wyler find Susan. The Doctor asks Tom if there is any sign of them, and it's no wonder they can't find them, as they have walked past the same Sugar Puffs poster about nine times. Apparently they had 180,000 to make this movie, so they needed Sugar Puffs to sponsor them, and they co-financed the movie. Sugar Puffs will turn up all over the place if you are vigilant. David tells Wyler and Louise that he has seen the Doctor and Tom. He then goes in search of the Doctor again. The Doctor finds Susan's handkerchief and they go to the river to investigate. They are surrounded by Robomen and even David's warning cannot save them. Their escape is blocked by a Dalek coming out of the Thames. Now this follows the TV series almost exactly, but the TV series felt scarier. What they both forget however is that Daleks are not robots. How would they breathe in the water? And what would stop the vents filling up with water? Calids were genetically modified, but they still need air to breathe. The Dalek orders the Robomen to take the Doctor to the spaceship, and once again, the Doctor is captured by the Daleks. The Robomen move in a less than robotic manner, whereas in the TV series, they are much more mechanoid. The jazz music, which is not conducive to science fiction, rambles on in the background. The Daleks were on high alert, so David decided to escape. Louise and Susan are introduced to Dortmund, the wheelchair-bound scientist working for a way to defeat the Daleks. He is the same character in the movie as he is in the TV series, both valiant in their thoughts and ideas and both doomed to failure. He says there is nothing they can do for Susan's grandfather. The Daleks are the masters of Earth! The Daleks? 
it is strange that the Daleks broadcast over Earth Radio. I mean, the Daleks wiped out everything, and yet they broadcast on an Earth waveband to tell people they are the masters of the Earth. Obey motorized dustbins, or you'll see about that. Gortman says, we'll show them who the masters are, as he picks up a bomb. Gortman tells Louise that they have turned the whole of Bedfordshire into a giant mining area. He says, we can fight back, and it's coming full circle, and our day is coming. While Louis is more skeptical, David comes back and enters via a secret entrance. I have no idea how they power and everything, as I am sure the Daleks would have destroyed all the power stations and solar power doesn't work very well in Britain, especially underground. David tells Louise that the Doctor and Tom were captured and taken to a flying saucer. Louise emotes with a level only akin to a wet cabbage. Come back Barbara, all is forgiven. Then, finally, we get to see the flying saucer in all its glory, except it isn't. It doesn't actually look anything like the ship we saw flying. The reason being is that the artist who drew this ship had no access to the model, and he painted it as best as he could. It's an impressive set, but it doesn't look realistic at all. I believe they used front projection to overlay the drawn ship over the real footage. A similar system was used in 2001 A Space Odyssey, and this movie was also filmed at Shepperton Studios. This saucer was also used in another movie as well, The Body Stealers. The Daleks are taking their prisoners to the ship, the Doctor included. Two prisoners attempt to escape, and the Daleks fire their fire extinguishers at them. The poor stuntman who falls off the wall unfortunately breaks his leg in real life but bravely comes back later in the movie to be bravely killed again by the Daleks. Originally, the Daleks were supposed to shoot fire but they were forced by the studio to make them more child friendly after concerns were raised by the BBFC. As a result, they had to use CO2 fire extinguishers. This is where the TV series totally owns the movie. The Daleks fired lethal death rays and did not have to use kettles or fire extinguishers. You will notice, however, that the Robomen fire lethal lasers, which were more powerful. It obviously would cost them too much to change this. I just wish they had given these kind of weapons to the Daleks. How they become the master race, I don't know. The stupid thing is that being boiled alive by a kettle is probably a worse death than being hit by a death ray. So the prisoners enter the saucer, a conglomeration of wood and metal. It's like the interior of the ship was designed by IKEA. The prisoners are divided up and the Daleks chant in the monotonous monotones. Forward, last, three, prisoners! The Doctor asks Tom for something non-conductive and Tom just happens to have a comb. I've got a comb here, Doctor. Gone are the days when men used to travel around with combs in their pocket. The Doctor forced in the comb and opened the door, although it comes to no avail. The Daleks were expecting someone to escape. It was an intelligence test. They only pick the best to be Robomen, because it takes intelligence to become mindless robots. You will be robotized! Although the system doesn't really work. I mean, it was only the Doctor who was intelligent. Tom and the other guy wouldn't have got out on their own. So the Dalek starts offering food to the people on the radio again. Soon we will destroy London completely! How are they powering these radios? We know how this went down with the Kalids in the past, it didn't end too well. Dortmund said they were going to fight. He has bombs, but we know bombs are useless against Daleks. No, you can push a Dalek around, you can knock a Dalek over, you can blind a Dalek, but a bomb will do no damage. Daleks are impregnable, except when they are not. Dortmund has the idea of using the Roboman helmets as a disguise to get them closer to the Daleks, where they can use the useless bombs on them. David puts on a Roboman helmet, and strangely, it fits like a glove or a helmet. Now they can fight back against the Daleks. The first batch of Robomen are ready. The Daleks order them to obey the Daleks without question, although you would have thought that part of the robotizing process would have already conditioned into them. Some Robomen are not the same caliber as other Robomen, and they can't get their glasses on straight. It almost seems like the Daleks like to utilize Earth-type technology to robotize the humans, as they're using telephone kiosk covers in their machines. Again, this is a scene which is done much better in the TV series. Sometimes black and white can just give an atmosphere of fear and depression like George Orwell's 1984. So our heroes stand there as strange objects that resemble hairdryers lower over their head. I mean, I am not sure if they're going to get robotized or a quick cut and blow dry. A fake Roboman, for example David, tells the Daleks we are taking the prisoners to the spaceship. The problem is, David wouldn't know the correct protocol and there isn't even a password to get in. The Dalek doesn't even scan his radio device to see if it is working. The prisoners are led up the ramp. 
and you can't avoid staring at the bad wiring on the Dalek spaceship. I might add that an opposable thumb, not a sucker or a stick, could achieve such levels of untidiness. At least when they get to the top of the ramp, the Dalek asks him what set he came from. David grabs the Dalek and slides him down the ramp, because bombs can't destroy a Dalek. It appears all you need is a ramp. Why a Dalek would explode when going down a ramp too fast, I do not know. The men break in to save the Doctor and Tom, and yet another Dalek gets pushed around as easy as a supermarket trolley. The third man could not be saved. He had been totally converted into a Roboman with the sexy sunglasses that go with the job. Suddenly, Louise makes an appearance. We were wondering what happened to her, not. She hides in the spare helmet cupboard because it is the safest place on the ship as there is a handle on the door and Daleks haven't got hands. The corridors on the spaceship all look the same, almost like they were built on a BBC budget and not a movie budget. The bombs have little effect on over them, no dismembered limbs, no scarring at all. I mean these bombs don't act like any other bomb that I've ever seen. I'm starting to think that Dortmund was a charlatan. Tom runs down the corridor and asks everybody if they've seen a girl. He wasn't specific about which girl he meant, but everyone else on the ship were male, so you would think seeing a girl would trigger some memory. The Robomen came back to the ship with whips in hand, but they were useless in a fight. David shows us his excellent knife skills, and this movie compared to the first one is totally violent. Wilder gets injured, and he decides the house brick is a better weapon against the Roboman than the bombs that Dortmund invented, and took out a Roboman with one throw. The Doctor ran away with David, leaving everyone else to die, as the bombs they were throwing had no effect on the Daleks at all. They should have given up on the bombs, and just yanked the Daleks around with the sucker end. The brave men of London couldn't get away from those fire extinguishers. Wilder dives around the corner, leaving his men to get boiled away by the kettles on wheels. The Doctor and David ran down a lone street which wasn't the back lot of a film studio at all. They are headed off by four Daleks, and when they turn the other way, they face the same four Daleks. I mean, the studio could have changed the colours of it to make it a bit more believable. Oh, and this is great. David manages to find a crowbar to open a manhole cover so they can escape. Do you realise how long it would take to find a crowbar, even if you were looking for one? Also, manhole covers in Britain generally don't open this easy. They need a bit of effort, and they're usually damn heavy. The Daleks chase them with their fire extinguishers. The Daleks can't climb down the ladder yet. Tom is trying to find a way off the ship. He can't just slip past the Daleks, even though he has a Roboman suit on. He should have kept the helmet. Wilder slips away. What gets me at this point is the incessant jazz music being played in the background to create excitement, but it doesn't do what it thinks it's doing. Tom finds the helmet and puts it on, just as a Dalek comes past. Then we have a whole comedy scene with the Robomen. The trouble with this movie is that it is more serious than the first movie, but then goes into whole scenes of comedy. It doesn't know what it's trying to achieve. The whole comedy sequence goes on for far too long. You would think the Daleks would just inject their supplements into them. One of the Robomen can't even keep his helmet straight. I can't believe they left this shot in. It looks so bad. Finally, after what seems an age, we get back to Susan. She was the star of the first movie, but hardly gets a look in here. Wyler makes his way back to the secret base and comes through the electronic door, powered by something. He goes straight to a bowl and washes his hair. Must be a strange British custom picked up in the future, as I've never seen anyone in Britain do this. I'm not sure how they're powering the doors. Maybe they have a dozen rats in hamster wheels cycling away to produce the power needed to open the door. Wyler is the last survivor of Dortmund's terrible plan. He said the bombs were no good, and you can't fight metal with flesh and blood. Well, unless you have a ramp, or unless you pull a Dalek by the sucker. But apart from that, you can't fight a Dalek with flesh and blood. But you can't fight metal with flesh and blood. They decide to head back to the country, or Watford to be precise. London has become dangerous, even though they have free power and not an electric bill in sight. Susan leaves a message for the Doctor. The Doctor and David finally leave the sewer. It is light now, so they must have spent a long time down there. So then we get back to the comedy Robomen, the helmet still out of alignment, and obviously this was all done in one take. Louise wakes up in the helmet cupboard, but by this time we have forgotten she is actually in the movie. She leaves the cupboard door open, which would probably raise concern from a passing Dalek, and runs past an instrument that could only be used by a human, and had no place on a Dalek ship. Louise brushes past the paper plate machine, and hilarity ensues. Tom and Louise hide near an anaglypto wall, apparently very commonplace in the 60s. Tom asks Louise to get him out of this thing, meaning the suit. They are still on a Dalek ship, and he wants to remove the one thing that was helping him blend in. But whatever. 
The Doctor and David turn up at the secret hideout, with the doors powered by mice, and they wonder where Susan had gone. The Doctor totally misses the big handwritten message right behind him, but the message from Susan is right in front of David. He would be blinded not to see it. They don't see the message, but they go into the mine in Bedfordshire regardless. After all, it is where all the beds come from. The Doctor says to David, you don't have to come you know. But David wants to come regardless, as Ray Brooks gets paid by the hour. The flying saucer takes off, full of really dizzy Daleks. The Doctor says to David, I wonder if the constable's up there, but he doesn't ask about the Haywain or the Mona Lisa. So Tom and Louise are trapped against an anaglypta wall in the Dalek ship as they descend to Bedfordshire as well. Susan, Wyler and Dortman find a van in Watford. Dortman volunteers to open the door, even though he is in a wheelchair. This movie is strong in disability representation. The Daleks roll up and Dortmund wheels his chair towards them in a last ditch attempt to prove his bombs work. He throws a bomb and it has no effect, so he throws the whole bag of bombs and the building falls down on him and the Daleks trap in them. Strangely, his hair changes from grey to black before he is crushed by the rubble. In the TV series, Dortmund didn't have so much luck. He just gets exterminated. Meanwhile, the other Daleks are amassing in the street. You may know the street from other movies like Nightcrawler and the Great Centurion Strain Robbery. It is also the same street used in the robbery at the beginning of the movie. Wyla drives down the road, supposedly trying to avoid the Daleks, but ends up hitting every single one of them. Look! So vans, ramps, and people dragging Daleks are the only way to kill a Dalek. Don't ever use bombs. Oh, I do wish Barbara was in this movie. In the TV series, it was Barbara who bravely drove the van through the Daleks instead of Wyla. Barbara was a strong woman in Doctor Who. Unfortunately, Louise was forgettable. The van speeds away and it is chased by the saucer and it almost killed some professional stunt chickens. Susan exclaims there is a flying saucer overhead. It's coming closer! Wyla hits the brakes and both Wyla and Susan run for cover. The Dalek saucer destroys the van with red hot rays of power. Meanwhile, the Doctor and David are heading mine. Two Robermen jump up and in an instant David takes them out with two shots. It is amazing how David, who only found his gun five minutes earlier, is suddenly a crack shot with a rifle and can see behind him and yet only 20 minutes ago couldn't see a giant message for the doctor chalked on the door. The Dalek saucer lands in Bedfordshire and not a bed in sight. Tom and Louise wake up in their anaglypta room. They decide to escape through the disposal chute of the spaceship. Now there are a couple of problems I can see here. One, this is a spaceship. A disposal chute would not send rubbish out into space. It would probably incinerate anything that is put in there. We might have big grinding gears or such like. The other problem is that the drop from the spaceship to the ground must be well over 15 feet. They would possibly have broken their leg or got terribly sprained ankles. However, no injuries of this type were sustained. They discover they were at the edge of a giant mine. A man asks them if they just escaped from the ship. Of course they say yes, even though they don't know they can trust him. A rover man asks who they are and Tom hits him on the back of the head with a big stick. Bombs can't kill them, but sticks can. They hide the body under the tarpaulin. Tom doesn't think about taking his clothes and pretending again, even though this is exactly what he did on the ship earlier. They both hide in the tool shed, not knowing if they can trust this chappy they never met before. The Daleks should watch this tool shed. Seems like a lot goes on here. Susan and Wyler are walking around some trees. She hides, jumps out and goes boo. Cut that out! This does not make sense. Susan was one of the most intelligent characters in the first movie. Her grandfather is a scientist and she was reading advanced scientific books. Suddenly she starts acting like an immature child. This is not the Susan we know from the first movie. She apologised, but this seemed very out of character. She was supposed to be advanced compared to Wyler. It should be Susan telling him what to do, and if it was remade now, I'm sure it would be. Young Susan noticed a cottage. The music takes on a Star Trek F role theme. At the cottage they come across two ladies. The spooky woman points a shotgun at them and at this point I would be highly suspicious of two humans living so close to a Dalek stronghold. But no, what do I know? Susan, who was always so intelligent in the past, tells them their exact destination, which was the Dalek mine in Bedfordshire. Perhaps this Susan had a bump on the head since the last movie and lost all her intelligence. The older woman had a strange awkwardness to her, and the younger spooky woman looked shifty, but neither Susan or Wyler had any suspicions. Susan notices the fresh bread on the table and neurons start to click, but the light does not turn on. The old woman said they mend the clothes of the workers in the mines and the Daleks give them food. Since when has a Dalek had a bakery on a flying saucer? 
The spooky woman says to give them soup while she goes to deliver some clothes. However, I think she's going to rat out to the Daleks. Susan and Wyler tuck into the soup out of hunger. Then we go back to the mine where the background doesn't look painted at all. The Doctor and David get to the edge of the mine. The Doctor says the Daleks have a greater reason than mining for oil or coal. He says they must learn the reason for the mine to find the Dalek weakness. David said the Daleks have no weakness. He forgets how he pulled a Dalek down a ramp earlier. Ramps are the Dalek weakness. The Daleks have a far greater reason. A much more alien one. Strong enough to make them wage war on this planet. A knife appears at the Doctor's neck. Broccoli stands there with his trench coat on. The mark of a dodgy bloke if ever I saw one. Broccoli played by Philip Maddock, a most prolific Doctor Who Welsh actor who has been in such greats as The Power of Kroll, The Brain of Morbius, The War Games and of course The Crotons. He makes David drop his gun and Broccoli picks it up and points it at them. He is the classic archetype Nazi sympathiser. Broccoli offers to take them into the Dalek mine. He says he won't get in without him. The Doctor doesn't trust him because he is wearing a trench coat, a sure sign of a Nazi or somebody who doesn't want to get wet. However, it is the only way he will get into the mine. He says they can't go in until the early shift in the morning and he smiles with his evil grin. So the Doctor and David enter the cave and just stand there like lemons because they think we can't see them through the gap at the side. Night time falls and the spooky woman returns to the cottage. She is now looking even more spooky and shifty with a bag full of food. She shows her spoils to the old woman. By betraying their guests, the Daleks give her soup and carrots. Now I'm not sure where the Daleks get soup and carrots from. I mean they can't just pop down to the local supermarket. What they don't know is that Wyler is awake and he hears everything. Wyler and Susan try to sneak off and as they get to the door, a Dalek is waiting for them. The spooky lady had done for them. You will be exterminated! Next morning, Broccoli is cooking some beans on a campfire, not caring if the heat and the smoke might or may not alert the Daleks. He takes a cigarette out of his mouth, something he wouldn't see in a family oriented movie now. He brings the Dot and Tom to the same shed that Louise and Tom are hiding in. How convenient! The guy in the shed said the Daleks are going to extract the core from the Earth and pilot it like a spaceship. They're going to drop an explosive device and fracture the Earth's core. The Doctor asks for a plan of the mine workings and Broccoli volunteers to try and get hold of it with his wry sneaky smile. Then we see the mine for the first time perched high on a papier-mâché mountain. The Dalek mine with the Dalek shaped doorways made of wood and MDF and the green walls that looked hurriedly painted. The lack of a safety rail is disturbing. The blast is going to take place as scheduled, boomed the Dalek. They want to extract the Earth's magnetic core. What could go wrong? The Doctor said we must deflect the bomb so that it takes a different path and that would suck the Daleks into the very core of the Earth. Broccoli hung around long enough to hear the secret plan, which wasn't that secret. The Doctor said he had to make a diversion. He asked David to find a good hiding place for Louise, but she isn't important to the plot. I tell you this, Barbara wouldn't have hidden away. Tom and the ball guy sneak into the mine. It was easy. Not even a single guard or Dalek stopped them. Tom sees Craddock and says he's alright, but he knows he was turned into a Roboman on the ship earlier. Tom looks down the shaft, which for some reason has a pulsating light. Craddock slips the Roboman helmet on. Why was it off his head in the first place? Nobody knows. Craddock attempts to strangle Tom, but we know this won't go well for Craddock, as Tom is the hero and the comedy relief for the movie. Tom bravely runs away and leaves the ball guy to attack Craddock, as it doesn't matter if he dies, as he is not the hero or somebody who has hair. He pulls Craddock into the mineshaft and both get killed. Broccoli turns up at the shed and says that he has something that will help the Doctor, and when the Doctor leaves the shed, he is surrounded by Daleks. Never trust a man in a trench coat. Broccoli says he is sorry, but the doctor said he expected it. He knew that Broccoli would do this because he had a trench coat. One thing you will notice in this movie is that whenever the doctor is going somewhere, he makes a great show of putting on his gloves. But I suspect that soon the gloves will be coming off. Broccoli said, I told you he would be here, but Broccoli underestimated the Daleks and they exterminated him. There was no cry of exterminate, which is usually their battle cry, which is strange. After the shed was blown up, the Daleks stood there not moving at all, almost as if they were empty shells or they couldn't risk people being in the Daleks when the shed exploded. Tom, who is still in the mineshaft, pulls down some planks. The Daleks are up above celebrating that they have caught the Doctor while mobilising around the badly painted sage green walls. We get extremely long drawn out shaky cam shots of the yellow Dalek coming down the ramp which looks almost exactly like the same shot that we saw five minutes earlier. They manoeuvre the bomb into position while Tom bravely climbs the mine shaft. Strangely, for some unknown reason, the Daleks have gone with a red bomb. The Daleks can't decide at times whether to call it an explosive device, capsule or bomb. 
Meanwhile, the Daleks lead the prisoners, including Susan and Wyler, down another IKEA corridor. Then Susan bumps into the Doctor. It's all coming along very nicely. The Dalek gives them time to have a nice conversation, totally unlike the Daleks that I know. The Doctor puts his gloves on again. He means business now. The Dalek waits for them to have a nice chit chat and then tells them to move. The Doctor spots Tom down the shaft and this makes a nice change from Skippy the bush kangaroo. The Daleks haven't the ability to look over a hole so they don't see him. Susan acting daft, again, is over the safety rail and Wyler pulls her back. Where is the bright intelligent Susan from the first movie? Also, why have the Daleks built handrails when they don't own hands? The Doctor told the Daleks, I know your weakness. But the Daleks claim they have no weakness. The Doctor is really saying it aloud so that Tom can hear the plan. I mean, even though the Doctor already showed him the map and discussed the plan in detail, he still has to make sure the audience knows it too. The Doctor then makes his diversion. He runs to the microphone and shouts, Attention, all Robomen, attack the Daleks. Strangely, not one Roboman said, that ain't no Dalek, but went straight ahead and attacked the Daleks. What is even more weird is that all the Robomen took their helmets off. Why would they do this? I kind of thought that the Dalek conditioning wouldn't let them do this. Surely the helmet would have been fused with the brain. The Daleks fight back with their fire extinguishers. But as we all know, bombs can't kill a Dalek, but a couple of Robomen can wheel them about like supermarket trolleys. Unfortunately, due to the lack of safety rails, some of the Robomen get pushed over the sides by the Daleks. Strangely, the Daleks are now using rails in this movie, instead of minutes and hours, like in the first movie. Another thing they didn't learn from the first movie is never to have a counter. Just push the button straight away. You don't need a countdown to create dramatic tension. They release the explosive device, or bomb for short. The analog clock counts the rails away. Tom yanks at the planks. Why wait until now? Why wait until the countdown started? It's almost as if they're trying to create more dramatic tension. The bomb drops down the shaft and hits the blanks that Tom has placed there. Why didn't the Daleks block this hole? I mean, that should have been their first priority. Tom runs away as the bomb travels down the wrong shaft. It's going to detonate in 23 rails, relative that is. Tom escapes the mine and is confronted by a Dalek but it is easily defeated by a tarpaulin. So Daleks are impervious to bombs, but ramps, people and tarpaulins are deadly to them. The bomb explodes, sending the Daleks into confusion as the magnetic field builds up. There is a great easter egg here, and if you pause the movie at the start of the explosion, the Dalek ship is actually hidden in the first frame. I believe this was accidentally left in, because it is actually impossible for the human eye to see one frame in a movie, and they were saving money by reusing an explosion. The Doctor says that magnetism is bad for Daleks, but I'm pretty sure it is also bad for humans. But what do I know? The marvellous shots here of the Daleks collapsing, crashing and disaster ensues. The Dalek crashes through the only safety rail that they have managed to build. Another Dalek flies down the shaft with its supermarket trolley wheels on show to the world. Finally, we get the obligatory explosion and everything blows up. Strangely, the Robomen seem slightly less robotic as they are running away. A Dalek hurtles into a wall and leaves a comedy outline of the Dalek in the wall. Then what the hell is this? A most outrageously bad model which explodes fairly quickly. The saucer tries to take off, but due to the spinning dizzy Daleks and the Earth's magnetic core, it gets destroyed comes down in true Thunderbird style with suspiciously giant flames. Molten Earth rises to the surface and the Daleks are destroyed. Why was there molten lava? I mean this is Britain, not Mount Etna. Strangely it seems all the Robomen were suddenly back to normal. The bottomized humans are not what they used to be. The Doctor said the power to destroy them is at our feet. No, he doesn't mean shoes, he means the Earth's magnetic core. We finally end up in the TARDIS and Tom has his uniform back on, ready to go back into action. Tom exits the TARDIS before the burglary has happened. He violently hits the getaway driver, whom I hope does not get brain damage, because he hasn't actually committed a crime as yet. The jewelry shop front explodes and the criminals run out. Tom, the hero, coshes both of them and drives away. Strangely in movies, you can knock anyone out with one hit without brain damage ensuing. We will never know if he took them to the police station or stole all the money for himself. He said Detective Inspector Campbell, OBE, but then he looks back. We won't know if he made Detective Inspector or decided to take the money. The daughter waves as Tom drives off and you can plainly see that the TARDIS has suddenly got so much smaller on the inside that they forgot to hide the internal view of the police box. The ending of the TV series was much sadder. Believe me, my dear, your future lies with David, and not with a silly old buffer like me. And the Doctor realising that Susan 
should have her own life, locks her out of the TARDIS. It's a poignant epitaph, but one not shared in this movie. So I will start by saying what I don't like about the movie. I don't think it is as bleak as the TV series, and it isn't as scary. You never feel that any of the protagonists are ever in danger. I don't like the blatant product placement. I mean, there are sugar puffs everywhere, and I'm surprised that there isn't a shot of the Dalek slurping a sugar puff or exterminating a box of sugar puffs. I think the movie excels when it is being serious, but I hate the obvious shoehorned comedy segments of the movie. It goes from murder to a full on comedy dancing with Bernard Cribbins and the Rubbermen. I didn't like the removal of Barbara and replacing her with Louise. Barbara was a strong woman, Louise was a weak, forgettable character. Another thing I don't like is the Dalek fire extinguisher guns. I mean they changed to this to be more child friendly and yet being slowly boiled alive with steam is a much worse death than a quick laser shot or flames from a Dalek. It could have been so much better than the first movie but I ended up like in the first movie better. Now I will say what I like about the movie. I love the Dalek colours. In the first movie which claimed Technicolor they made all the Daleks so bright and colourful and yet in this movie the colours were more subdued. The majority of the Daleks had the blue and silver look which was closer to the TV series. The Dalek leader was red and we had the yellowish brush steel look Dalek. I loved the scale of the sets and the Dalek ship was excellent. My favourite shot has to be the Dalek ship blowing up the red van. I loved that the story started off darker in content than the first movie because in between the comedy it is a damn good movie. Oh and well done for Peter Cushion's wig maker, they did a stunning job there. What I really like is that if you look closely at the Dalek's clock you can see the initials TTP which actually stands for the trading post. But I like to think it really stands for the time profit. I will give this movie 5 out of 10 on the old time profit meter. It would have got a higher score if they removed the comedy. Peter Cushion once again knocks it out of the ballpark with his portrayal of the Doctor. It is time for the time profit to leave this universe. Please subscribe and I will bid you farewell. Thank you.